Amen. Uh, good morning. It's true that only crazy people go to Iowa in February. So I can attest to that. Um, we're really looking forward to hosting you guys. I think it's supposed to be negative 40 when you're there. So that's not true. I don't know what the weather's going to be like. Um, I feel a little like the uncle that you didn't know existed. Okay. So um, I'm, a, I'm Uncle Jake. You Don't call me that. But uh, my name's Jake. So Mercy Hill's the third church that we planted. And don't tell the other church plants, but your worship team's the best one, okay? So it, and I'm not joking. Uh, <laughs> like, man, that was phenomenal. But uh, it feels a little surreal. Uh, this first time I've been to Mercy Hill, this is the first time I've been to Ohio, okay? And it's great. I Iowa gets mixed up with Ohio and Idaho quite a bit, and uh, I've been, uh, I haven't been to Idaho either. I should go there as well. So, um, yeah, like Ernie said, my name's Jake. I'm the teaching pastor at uh, Candeo, and I just want to say before like, we get started into our passage this morning, um, we are just so incredibly proud of what this church is, what you represent, and um, you probably, I, I imagine that it's similar to if you live close to mountains, you just kind of get used to mountains because they're just always there, and so mountains are normal, and then other people come who don't live close to mountains, and they see the mountains, and they kind of freak out, and you're like, what is your problem? That's not a big deal. Well, that's a big deal, and I say all that to go, God is doing a unique thing here in Mercy Hill, and if you've been here a little while, you may be starting to just kind of see this church as normal. And let me just tell you from kind of like an outside perspective who talks to a lot of people who are planting churches, like what God is doing here is not normal. It's incredible. And you are part of something much bigger than yourself. And so we are so proud of you and we're so grateful for what God is doing uh, here at Mercy Hill. So um, my wife is with me. My wife, Sarah, last, uh, yeah, Woo. <laughs> marriage. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, this August, we will celebrate 15 years of marriage, and uh, we're, high, we're high school sweethearts, which, yeah, I don't recommend that, okay, <laughs> just saying, but um, it worked out for us, and uh, we're high school sweethearts, and uh, we dated long distance for a little while. I went to school in Chicago, and so we dated for a couple years long distance, then got married about halfway through my time at uh, Moody Bible Institute, and uh, we lived there for a while. Fast forward several years, and we moved to Iowa, and about five years after we were married, we had our first kid, uh, who is Naomi, and I think I have a picture of Naomi, so she, oh, so that's Sarah. Uh, this is Naomi. Um, the baby is not ours. That's one of our friend's babies. But uh, this is Naomi. She's 10 years old. She's in fourth grade. She's incredibly smart. Uh, she's, I think I have one more year before she's smarter than me. And so I'm going to get it in in this last year. But she's incredibly smart. She loves books. Uh, she loves music. And, um, and she is, <laughs> my wife keeps saying, stop, stop saying this. But it's just true. She's going to change the world. Now, I don't know if it's going to be for the better or not. <laughs> Or if it's going to be, you know, you can go either way on that. And so, but we'll find out. Uh, that's Naomi. So then fast forward a, another couple years. Uh, three years later, we have Judah, uh, who is now seven. We were just in Gainesville at our church plant with a worse worship team than yours. And, um, <laughs> no, they're, they're fine too. And... Uh, so that's Judah. He's seven. He's in first grade. And we call him Joyful Judah because his main goal in life is to make sure that everyone's having fun. He's kind of like conflict averse. And so as long as you're having fun, he's cool with it. He loves balls. He loves Mario Kart. He loves anything, um, any sort of like, a, like, I don't know what you call it, like racket sport or like, um, like club sport, you could say, like, a, like golf and hockey and croquet. He's a Jedi master at croquet. I've only beat him like three times and he's seven. So either he's really good or I'm really bad. It's probably a little bit of both. Um, so th this next picture is probably what you would call the, the Instagram version of our picture, right? Because normal people dress up in nice clothes and then hang out in the woods because that's what you do, right? And so this is the picture you share on Instagram and everyone thinks you've got a great, perfect family and everyone's happy and growing and healthy. Now, this next picture, is, though, is probably a bit more accurate. <laughs> it's a bit more accurate. Uh, part of it is because it's a caricature, obviously. Um, my beard was grown out in, in this instance. But uh, our sister-in-law uh, has this little business where she does embroidery work. And part of the reason why this picture is 
a bit more accurate to our family is that while our Instagram picture would say that we're a happy family of four, the reality is that we're actually a family of nine. And those little hearts over our heads represent the children who, the five children who over the last 10 years we have lost to miscarriage. Justice, who would have been 11 this year, Hope would have been seven, Piper would have been three, Mariah would have been two, and Elijah would have been turning just a year old. These are children that we've never held in our arms, that we've only seen on a screen, and that Sarah has only felt in her body. And the question this morning is, have you ever wondered, where is God in the brokenness of life? Have you ever wondered, where is God when it seems like he's nowhere to be found? Whether it's the loss of a child or the loss of a spouse or a parent or the disintegration of a relationship that you thought was going really well and then all of a sudden it just kind of like ended, right? Or maybe it's the, the anxiety and the panic attacks the seasons of depression, the dark night of the soul. What do you do in the midst of unexplained suffering? See, I think a lot of us kind of know what to do with suffering in general, at least if we can see a purpose to it, right? Like if we hear about someone who, who, uh, who died, maybe saving someone from an accident or pulling them from a car crash, but they died in the process, we can at least kind of wrap our minds around that. We go, okay, at least there was, that's, that's terrible, but at least there was a purpose to that, but what do you do when it doesn't seem like there's any purpose to what you're going through? What can you do when it feels like God isn't there? The question this morning is, what kind of songs can sad Christians sing? So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open to Psalm chapter 42. If you grab the Bible under your seat, I believe it's on page 519. But Psalm 42 and 43, both of these chapters are generally put together, though they're separated by their numbers. Um, And these are are psalms uh, that are called psalms of lament. You're in a series right now in the book of Psalms, and the book of Psalms can basically be categorized by two different kinds of psalms. You have psalms of praise, but then you also have psalms of lament. And what Psalm 42 and 43 are is that they are songs, they are psalms of lament. Lament. They aren't the only psalms of lament. There are a ton of them. But what psalms of lament are is psalms of lament in the book of Psalms is that they are prayers to God in the midst of pain while living in a broken world. They're prayers to God in the midst of pain while living in a broken world. And there are three different kinds of lament in the book of Psalms. There are psalms of lament that see evil in the world and then they call on God to step in and to deal with the evil and with the injustice that's going on in the world. Theologians call these psalms the imprecatory psalms where you're where you calling on God to exact justice and judgment on evil in the world. Those are imprecatory psalms. You have another kind of psalm that are psalms, uh, that are psalms of lament that are cries out to God in the midst of evil that someone has personally done. So uh, they are cries to God asking for his forgiveness and asking for reconciliation with him because of something that you have done as you have sinned against God or sinned against other people. We call these psalms of confession. So you have imprecatory psalms, you have psalms of confession, those are two kinds of laments, but then you have a third kind of lament in the book of Psalms. There's a third kind of lament, which is what we have here in Psalm 42, which are songs or prayers from a place of loneliness or spiritual dryness or depression. In Psalm 42 and 43 is this third kind of psalm because what we see in these psalms is that we actually don't see the psalmist asking God to exact judgment on any, anyone or anything. And we also don't see the psalmist confessing any sort of sin that he has done. And so it can't be an imprecatory psalm. It can't be a psalm of confession. And so it's this third kind of psalm. What Psalm 42 and 43 is the, it's the cry of a person who no longer feels the Lord's presence like they once did and they don't know why. And this is the picture that the psalmist begins with in verse 1. 42 verse 1. Here's what he says. 
As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now, I don't know about the deer situation uh, here in Iowa. Our deer are basically like small cows because they just kind of graze in the cornfields and they get enormous. And then they run in front of your car and total your car. And so, but, uh, but deer, what you see in, in the Psalms a lot is, uh, is God referred to as a shepherd, which then implies that we are sheep. Now, sheep are incredibly stupid. Deer, on the other hand, are not... They're still dumb because they run in front of your car, but they're not as dumb as sheep because the reality is that deer, they don't wait until they're dying of thirst to look for water. They don't do that. They kind of like think ahead. They, they know what they need and then they go and get it. And the picture right here is that the psalmist is panting for the Lord. And right here at the beginning, it's that picture of a deer who goes to what was once a source of water. And when it shows up, what used to have a bunch of water. I used to come here every day and there was a bunch of water. What, but he now shows up and it's a dry river, riverbed. And what the psalmist is doing is that he's saying, I am like the deer. And God is like the dry riverbed. I used to come here. God used to be here. I used to be able to drink and have my fill. And yet now I've come. And it's all dried up. Seems like God isn't there. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, like nothing's changed, right? Like your, your spiritual disciplines haven't changed, nothing has changed, but then all of a sudden it feels like God is far away and you're going, why? I'm still reading my Bible, I'm still praying, I'm still going to church, I'm still in connect, like nothing has changed in the, 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 the spiritual habits in my life and yet now for some reason it feels like the God who once felt very close is now far away. You see, the psalmist isn't questioning God's existence. He's not saying God never existed, where is he? No, he's saying I used to deeply feel God's presence, and now he's nowhere to be found. The things that used to give him a sense of God's presence no longer comfort him like they used to. And this, there's like an intense spiritual dryness, seemingly out of the blue, even though he's done nothing wrong. You see, we Americans have a really hard time with this. We have a really hard time with this because if you've grown up in the West, the, the perception that we've had like programmed into our mind is that success in life is when you are healthy and when you are wealthy and when you are happy. Like if, you, if you're healthy, if you're wealthy, if you're happy, then you are therefore successful. So the, the logic then goes, if I'm not healthy, if I'm not wealthy, and if I'm not happy, then somehow I've done something wrong. We're incredibly moralistic in this way. And the sad part is is that Christians in America aren't really all that much better. We're we're pretty much the same because when we're in a time of spiritual dryness, then we think that it must certainly because there's some unrepentant sin in my life. I'm not reading the Bible enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not doing enough spiritual things. I'm not pulling the right levers. I'm not pressing the right buttons. And so therefore, if I'm I'm feeling spiritually dry, then, then there must be something incredibly wrong with me. And maybe some of you are sitting here this morning, and this may perhaps be one of the reasons why you have yet to admit to anybody that you actually feel like God isn't there. Because what can happen in American Christianity, is that to admit that you are experiencing spiritual dryness, to admit that you're spiritually dry, is pretty much tantamount to saying that I'm a spiritual failure. But nowhere in this psalm is there a confession of sin or an admission of guilt. And instead, the psalmist feels this way out of the blue, which is incredibly important because while it is true, you, we'll see this in other psalms, uh, you surely will in your series, that while it is true that, this, that, that times of spiritual dryness can come as a result of unrepentant sin and can come as a result of neglecting the normal spiritual disciplines, the reality is, is that times of spiritual dryness can also come simply as a result of living in a fallen world, that we live in a broken world. And this is important for some of you to know because some of you are really new in your faith. You've just recently come to Christ 
And you, you have this like spiritual vibrancy and excitement. And what you need to know is that, one, that is fantastic and amazing, praise God. But the reality is that for whatever the excitement and the vibrancy that you have right now, you need to know that at some point it will probably happen in your walk with God that God will feel far away. Because if you don't know that and if you don't expect that, when that time comes, it can be an incredibly painful and confusing time because you're gonna think that something's broken. You're gonna think that something's wrong. And you're, it can, for many people, because they don't expect this to happen and that spiritual vibrancy begins to kind of seem, seem to seemingly fade away, you can begin to wonder, was this Christianity thing even real in the first place? Or was this just kind of like some spiritual high that I was kind of like writing for a while, but it wasn't really real anyway, so you kind of like abandon the faith. A lot of people do that. What you need to know is that actually this experience is normal, and it doesn't mean that Christianity isn't real. And it doesn't mean that God actually isn't there. Now, knowing that something is normal doesn't make it easier, all right? I'm not trying to say that, but what I am saying is that knowing that something is normal, though, can help you know that you're not crazy while it's happening. So, how does a Christian walk through spiritual depression? How do we do that? I want to show you from these Psalms, I want, to sh- I want to show you two things that don't help and three things that do. That's probably like the worst sermon outline, you know, but it's all I got, all right? So two things that don't help in the midst of spiritual depression and then three things that do. So two things that don't help. The first one is, spirit, is, is physical weariness. Look at chapter 42, verse 3. He says, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you. I'm I'm thirsty for God. And then verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night, while they sang to me all the day long, Where is your God? Notice this. His tears have been his food day and night. In other words, he isn't eating. And it's day and night. And so... It would seem as though what is happening here with the psalmist is that he isn't really eating because his tears are the only thing he's eating, and he isn't really sleeping either. These are what we would probably identify today as clinical depression. Not eating, not sleeping. He's lost his appetite, and he can't sleep. There's, this, there's a, an ancient heresy called Gnosticism. You'll, you'll find it a lot in the New Testament. Um, what Gnosticism basically was, it was more than this, but this is kind of a summary, is that it basically pitted the body against the soul, that all that, was, that all that is material is evil and all that is spiritual is good. And you could go, wow, what unsophisticated, what unsophisticated uh, ancient people. But we do the same thing because we have a terrible tendency to put the body and the soul against each other. We can have a tendency to see life as that what is meaningful and important is spiritual and then how we take care of our bodies is inconsequential. But that couldn't be farther from the case. Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a physician, uh, he's a famous preacher, but before he was a famous preacher, he was actually a physician. He said this, it's a little long, but follow with me here. He says, does anyone hold to the view that as long as you are a Christian, then it doesn't matter what the condition of your body is. You'll soon be disillusioned if you believe that. There are some in whose case it is clear to me that the cause of their depression is mainly physical. On the other hand, people who are physically weak are more prone to spiritual attacks and depression. But if you recognize that the physical may be partly responsible for the spiritual condition and make allowance for this, you'll be better able to deal with the spiritual issues. Now, this isn't to say that the only explanation for spiritual dryness, for spiritual depression, is a lack of physical care, but it is to say that if you neglect your physical well-being, it will also often bring with it unintended spiritual consequences. You know this, if, if you have kids, you know this to be experientially true. If you're just a human, you know this to be experientially true. Here's, here's what I mean. We have a child, I won't say their name, I'll try not to say their name, who they, out of the blue, inexplicably, will become the meanest, 
saddest, most irresponsible, disrespectful person on the planet. And what we found is that most often the remedy for this emotional distress and unhappiness doesn't come from a lecture, it doesn't come from a Bible verse, it doesn't come from discipline. The most reliable remedy we have found for this condition in this child is a snack. <laughs> They're hungry, right? You, you might be feeling this right now. You're like, dude, when are you gonna shut up? Like, I know it's 10.45, but I'm ready for lunch. Like, you're just kind of there, right? Some of you are neglecting to take care of your body and you're unknowingly doing it to the detriment of your soul. You see, perhaps the most spiritual thing some of you could do this afternoon is take a nap. Sleeping can be a spiritual activity, especially for some of you workaholic types, because you know what happens when we're sleeping? I recognize that for some of us, sleeping is a real big inconvenience. Some of you love it, some of us hate it. I'm, I'm kind of indifferent, I'm probably more on the hate it side, because I go, why do I have to live a third of my life unconscious? Like, God did not have to create us that way. Like, if, if, if it took me as long to fill up my car as it took for me to sleep, I would never own a car. It would not be worth it, right? It's just like eight hours? Are you kidding me? I, there's so much to do, but why? Why is sleeping actually a spiritual activity? It's because here's what's happening when you're sleeping. When, you, when you're sleeping, what you're doing is you are, it's a real tangible display to be able to say, God, I trust you to work even while I sleep. That actually you are the one who upholds the universe by the word of your power, not me. And so therefore, I can sleep because I know that everything doesn't depend on me. Sleeping is actually a spiritual activity because sleeping is an act of trust. So what doesn't help in spiritual depression? Sleep deprivation or physical dep sleep deprivation too. But physical deprivation doesn't help. In spiritual dryness. What else doesn't help? Look at verse 4. 42 verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise. A multitude keeping festival. Now we don't quite know the circumstances surrounding the psalmist here. But for whatever reason the psalmist has experienced a disruption in community. So you have physical deprivation, but then there's a disruption in community. Notice how he's reminiscing on, the, on past days, how he used to go up with the many, how he used to lead the festive, the festive procession, but now he's isolated from the many. He isn't part of the procession. In other words, he's had a disruption of community. Now, the sad reality, the sad truth is that many of us, we see spiritual community more as a luxury than as a necessity. Uh, some, something has happened in the last, I would say, probably 60 years where there is a kind of view of spiritual formation that is, that is incredibly individualistic, where we think in our minds that as long as I have my own personal time with God in the Bible, my own, my own personal devotions, my own personal times of worship, my own personal times of prayer, as long as I just do all of these things personally, then I'll be fine. And then we think of like the broader community of faith, the, the, the greater spiritual gathering, both on, you know, you could call that on Sunday mornings or even in the context of, of small groups like connection groups, we tend to see those things as, as long as my personal disciplines are good, then the communal ones are just kind of icing on the cake. When the reality is, is that God has designed us for spiritual community so that it's not just a nice option to fit into your life if it works with your schedule, but instead that spiritual community is a spiritual necessity as a means of grace that God has divinely ordained as a way of applying his truths to our lives, as a means of watering our dry souls. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a, a pastor in Germany during World War II, he, he says this of spiritual community. He says this. He says, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's words to him. He needs him again and again 
when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. He needs his brother man as a bearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. He needs his brother solely because of Christ. And check this out. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. What is he saying? Is he saying that Christ is weak? He's saying, no, Christ isn't weak. But isn't it true that sometimes a truth that you have thought in your mind, that you have said to yourself, rings more true when it comes from the mouth of someone else? That all of the things that you go, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. When someone else speaks it to you, that God works in in a unique way to apply that truth that you may have already known, but because it came from someone else, it actually sticks a little bit more. I don't know about you, but I hate admitting that I'm weak. I hate it. I, I want to come up here, especially this, just, just visiting you, like it'd be so easy to just like put on a face I want to come up here, and I want you to think that I'm competent. I want you to think that I'm strong. I want you to like me. Like, that sounds needy, right? You know? I don't want to admit that I'm weak. My guess is is that a lot of you don't either. But the reality is, is that God will often bring the gentle reign of his gracious truth through the loving words of a fellow believer. You go, I'm feeling dry. I need some rain. Often God will rain on you through the words of someone else. But in order for that to happen, we have to be present. We have to be vulnerable. We have to be a place. We have to be a church. We have to be a network where it's okay, where you can walk into the context of spiritual community and and for it to be okay for you to say, I really don't feel like God is there. And then people don't look at, we don't treat one another as if that's a weird thing because we can actually realize that that's something that's normal. That we don't abandon each other in the dark when we are in seasons of spiritual depression. We need to have friends who will pursue us. We need to have friends who will listen to us. We need to have friends who will care for us. And we need to have friends who will tell us what is robustly true. Do you have friends like that? Or, if you see life as purely physical, then when you're in a time of spiritual dryness, or when you're struggling, then the solution will just be to just pop a pill. Because it's just, it's only a physical problem. Or if you just, if you see life kind of like unidimensionally, and you just go, well, life is mainly about like moral Like all of the issues in life are like either right or they're wrong. And so if you're struggling, then your solution, if you just like view life as just purely morality, then your solution to to struggling is going to be to just suck it up. I just got to suck it up. I just got to try harder. I'm just going to get over it and move on. I'm going to keep going. Or if you see life as purely emotional then what you'll tend to do is you'll you'll tend to try to surround yourself with people who, who will just listen and accept. Listen to how you're feeling and accept and validate. And and if you see life as just purely emotional, you'll you'll probably never actually want to be challenged with anything. You probably never want to be told that you're wrong. But see, the Christian community ought not be a place where we reduce life to just being down to one of these things, but that we recognize that, that instead we need physical care and we need emotional care. And we need robust, challenging truth. You see, Christianity offers us an approach to suffering that is much more three-dimensional than what many in the world will often tell you. That we are physical people. We are emotional people. We are spiritual people. And we need robust truth in the midst of suffering. So those are two things that don't help in the midst of spiritual dryness. uh, Physical deprivation and a disruption of community real quickly. So what does help? If that's what doesn't help, then what does help? Three things, real quick. Three things you should do when you're in the dark night of the soul. I'll give give you all three and then we'll walk through them real quick. So the first one is pour out your soul. 
Pour out your soul. Number two is preach to your heart. And number three is praise him in the dark. Pour out your soul. Preach to your heart. Praise him in the dark. So pour out your soul. That's, that's 42 verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. Now, this is super obvious, but it's really easy for us to miss. What's going on here? The psalmist in Psalm 42 and 43 is saying, I don't feel God. I'm getting nothing out of worship. I'm getting nothing out of prayer. All the things that I've done before, don't give me what they used to give me. That's the deer going to the stream, right? Like, I used to come here, and it was full of water, and now it's totally dry. I feel like God has left me. And notice, who is he saying this to? He's saying all of this to the very God he doesn't feel is there. Do you feel like God isn't anywhere to be found in your situation? Tell him. Do you feel like God has abandoned you? Tell him that. Do you feel like you're getting nothing out of him? Do you feel like God has let you down totally? Tell him. When the psalmist feels like there was no one at the other end of his prayers, what did he do? He kept praying. You see, our tendency in the midst of spiritual dryness, in the midst of spiritual depression, is often to lean away from spiritual disciplines, is often to pray less, is often to read less, is often to pull away from our, from our community. But what, the, what we see with the psalmist is that as he is in the midst of spiritual depression, he actually leans into those disciplines even more. That he tells the God he doesn't think is there, he tells the God he doesn't think is there that he doesn't think he's there. Even though you don't feel like your prayers are doing anything, they're doing something. Are you spiritually dry? Pour out your soul. Are you spiritually dry? Number two, preach to your heart. Three times he asks his Three times he asks his soul why he's downcast, and three times he tells his soul what to do. In other words, what the psalmist does is he does what each and every one of us need to learn how to do, and that is become a preacher. There you go. Whoa. Listen. Like, I get it. Okay, Ernie and I were just talking about this last, uh, this morning, actually, on the way here. It's like, you tell people that you're a pastor for your job, and all of a sudden, that conversation is done. Like, like you are the, you are, might as well be a space alien, okay? Like, they treat you like that, and you say, like, whoa, become a preacher? I would never tell someone I'm a preacher. No, I'm not saying, like, you get up on a stage, and you open the Bible and preach to people. But what I'm saying is, is that we need to learn how to preach to our own heart. Real quick, I, I Obviously, I love Lloyd-Jones. I've been quoting him a lot here. Here's what he says. He says, have you realized that so much of the unhappiness in your life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? You see, in these three instances, the psalmist isn't talking to God. He isn't even talking to the reader. He's talking to his own soul. Notice this. He's poured out his heart. He's poured out his soul. He's expressed his emotions. He's expressed those feelings directly to God. And then at some point in the midst of that expression, he grabs his own heart by the collar and says, you've said enough. Now it's time for you to listen. And perhaps many of us need to learn to do the same, to stop letting our feelings have the last word but to start preaching to our own heart and to start telling to to start giving our hearts the truth that it so desperately needs. Do you know how to do that? Yes, to express those feelings, to pour out your soul. But do you then know how to turn that corner and to preach to your own heart and to tell your heart the truths that it is so struggling to believe? And if you don't know how to do that, do you have friends who can do that for you? Do you have friends who, yes, will listen to you, who will let you pour out your soul, but who at some point will speak into your suffering with robust truth that maybe you already know it intellectually, but you need the words of somebody else to apply it to your heart in such a way that you couldn't do on your own? Do you have friends like that who will speak truth to your heart when you don't have the words? So pour out your soul, preach to your heart, and finally praise him in the dark. Notice this. 
This psalm does, these psalms don't end with a happy ending. We love happy endings, right? Every movie we go to, you, do, you can get through it because you know, like, they're not going to make money if it's not a happy ending. It's a very Western thing. But, like, they found Nemo, right? They found him. What if they did what if that didn't go that way, right? Like, what if Nemo got stuck in the little water filter and died? <laughs> and then the credits rolled, you know, and you're like, what the heck? Like, what? That would have made no money, okay? Like, three people would have seen it, and they would have told all their friends, do not take your kids to Finding Nemo. They found him. They just killed him, okay? Like, we like happy endings, and yet what we have with Psalm 43 is not a tidy bow, it's not a happy ending. It's not like the psalmist gets to the end of Psalm 43 and goes, whew, I'm glad I got that off my chest. I'm feeling a lot better now. That doesn't happen. No, he's still in the darkness all throughout this. And yet three times when he's preaching to his heart, what does he do? He vows to praise God in the dark. Here's what he says. Put my Put your hope in God. He's speaking to his own heart. Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him. For I will still praise him. For I will still praise him. What's he saying? He's saying that even when I don't feel like praising God, I will still praise him. Because he knows that at the end of the day, that his worship of God is not based on his feelings, but it's based on God's worthiness. That regardless of how we feel, regardless of what we're going through, that God is worthy to be praised. And so perhaps you're the kind of person, many of us are like this, who wait until you're feeling affections for God before you respond in praise to God. But what the psalmist is saying is almost the exact opposite of what we tend to want to do. What he's saying is, even though I don't feel it, I'm going to praise him in the pain. Even though I don't feel it, I'm going to praise him in the dark. So, what kind of songs can sad Christians sing? Sad Christians can sing psalms of lament. And the reason that we can sing psalms of lament, check this out, the reason we can do that is because we know that 2,000 years ago, there was a man who in his darkest moment sang a psalm of lament. And what was that psalm? Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You see, maybe you've missed that the thing that Jesus cried out on the cross was not an in-the-moment thing. He's actually quoting Psalm 22. That Jesus Christ, hanging on that Roman cross, in his darkest moment, in his deepest pain, he cried out to God, not with trite, overly cliche, overly optimistic cliches, but with a psalm of lament. So do you feel like God is far away? Jesus was cast off so that you would be brought near. Do you feel like God has abandoned you? Know this. Jesus was truly forsaken so that you would never be forsaken. Yeah. Are you thirsty? Is your soul parched? Are you weary? Do you thirst for God? Jesus Christ. Thirst on a cross so that you and I would have living water that would never want run dry. You see, he bore the agony of our sins so that we could have him in the agony of our pain. You see, some of you this morning, you don't know what to do in the midst of unexplained suffering because you haven't yet received Jesus Christ who suffered for you. Friends, cease from your striving. Cease from your striving and turn to the Savior. Stop your humanistic coping and turn to Christ. For those of you who are depressed, for those of you whose soul is dry, pour out your soul, preach to your heart, and praise him in the dark. Let's pray together. Jesus, you cried out in agony 
Where is God? Why have you forsaken me? You did that so that we would never have to be truly abandoned. So that we would know that because of you, Jesus, we are not forsaken, but we are embraced. That we are not abandoned, but we are adopted. That we are not unloved and unwanted, but we are deeply accepted because of your blood. God, I pray for anyone in here who has yet to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, that that in the midst of their suffering, perhaps even now, that they would look to the Savior who suffered for them. And Lord, for my friends who are in the midst of a season that they can't explain, that they don't know why they feel the way that they do, and they don't know why it feels as though you are far off, Lord, I pray that you would, in a real tangible way, this morning and this week, that you would draw near to them that you would assure them of your presence and that the community around them would remind them of the joy of their salvation. We thank you for being the God who is near. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.